please allow me to welcome you all again to the Society of Georgia Archivists 51st annual meeting, our first ever all virtual conference. Thank you all for tuning in today and for your dedication to SGA. As Catherine said, I'm Angela Stanley, 2020 SGA president and director of archival services and digital initiatives for the Georgia Public Library Service. And I'm thrilled that we have finally made it to this moment here with all of you. That is something to celebrate. Today is Wednesday, November 11th, 2020, Veterans Day, also once known as Armistice Day. To all those who have served and those who continue to serve, I hope you're having a meaningful day and we thank you for being here. May we all take a moment to be grateful for our freedoms and work to cultivate peace. Hopefully by now we have all acknowledged in our various personal and professional spaces what a tumultuous, uncertain and exhausting year 2020 has been. We are being challenged to rally and respond not only to the pandemic and its consequent financial pressures, but also to social, political, and environmental change. The pace of this year has been unrelenting, and I am deeply grateful for the hard work, leadership, and sacrifices that each of you has made. Indeed, as I say these words, I also acknowledge that my child may come barreling through the door asking for a snack, or that my dog might start barking at Lord knows what. So I want to set the expectation now that our lives are not separate from our work and that our families, our pets, and our colleagues are a part of our community too. So please feel free to introduce your kids, share photos of your pets, and make this conference orbit in your universe. Just be sure to tag us at hashtag SOGA2020. The annual meeting planning committees have taken great care to schedule this virtual meeting with your well-being in mind. They've spread the content out over multiple days, reducing the length of time we all need to be plugged in on a screen, and they've scheduled frequent breaks. But I still encourage you to practice active self-care throughout the next three days. Please take time to stretch, move around, eat, drink lots of water, ignore your emails, go outside, pet your fur babies, or simply check out when you need to. One of the best pieces of advice I ever received came from my incredible yoga instructor, Nick Combs, who said, we can always find one way to make ourselves even more at ease. Find that thing and do it. So at the same time that 2020 has felt like a dumpster fire taking place on a train wreck during the apocalypse, we as archivists know that history belies this narrative. This year is not an accident of fate. We know simply by being stewards of the historical record that 2020 is the outcome of centuries of deliberate planning, policymaking, genocide, warfare, racism, sexism, classism, and wanton environmental abuse. We are here by design. This is not a political statement, but rather a refusal to overlook the traumas of the past to make the present more palatable. And yet we are also here on the shoulders of giants who have fought valiantly on the side of justice. The Honorable John Lewis, Stacey Abrams, Tamika Atkins, Mocha Jasmine Johnson, and countless others here in Georgia alone. Leaders and advocates who have been thinking, writing, screaming about these issues since forever. It is our job as archivists, not only to listen and read their words, but to actively intercede to avoid the historical erasure fake news and double think that would have us believe 2020 was an anomaly. Our most fundamental freedoms depend on our ability, both as individuals and as a nation, to make decisions about the future based on an authentic and documented record of the past. Representative Lewis may have said it best when he said, freedom is not a state, it is an act. It is not some enchanted garden perched high on a distant plateau where we can finally sit down and rest. Freedom is the continuous action we must all take, and each generation must do its part to create an even more fair, even more just society. 2020 may be a year of reckoning, but it has the potential to also begin an active process of learning, undoing, planning, progress, and healing. Back before the pandemic hit the United States with its fullest force, past and current SGA board members got together to discuss the creation of a new strategic plan and the direction we hoped the organization would take over the next five years. The process was rooted in specific actions, 
the board could take to advance its mission and vision. During this retreat and under the direction of strategic planning consultant Stephen Hauser, director of the Twin Lakes Library System in Milledgeville, and Andrea Jackson Gavin, grant writer for the Atlanta University Center's Woodruff Library and 2018 SGA Fellow, we cultivated a new plan that centers SGA's statement on diversity and inclusion and SAA's statement on Black Lives and Archives in all aspects of our work. The new plan will be unveiled at tomorrow's business meeting taking place at 10 a.m. and I encourage you all to attend. The Society of Georgia Archivists defines inclusion as its commitment to ongoing and cumulative efforts, including policies, principles, practices, recruitment, and activities that engage an increasingly diverse community in a welcoming, equitable, and responsive manner. This year's theme, Building Partnerships and Dismantling Barriers, asks presenters to examine how archivists can strengthen their relationships with researchers, donors, colleagues, and allied organizations, reimagine traditional structures, systems, and practices to enhance the profession's growth and impact, and facilitate broad access to collections and services. I am looking forward to learning from all of you over the next three days. I want to thank the SGA board and everyone who had a hand in organizing this conference twice, first for an in-person meeting and then virtually, especially Catherine Fisher and the program committee, Virginia Angles and the local arrangements committee, Becky Sherman and the education committee, outreach manager, Katie Twomey, Holly Croft and the membership committee and the nominating committee, including chair Shawnee Moraine and committee members, Fiji Hall and Tiffany at Waterloo. Finally, before I introduce our keynote speaker, I want to acknowledge the loss of an archives giant. Dr. David Gracie II passed away on September 26, 2020 at the age of 79. Dr. Gracie had a profound impact on SGA, the archives profession, and many of you, and he will be forever remembered for his kindness, humor, and indefatigable advocacy. He served as the third ever SGA president, was founding editor of Provenance, sat on the State Historical Records Advisory Board of Georgia, and for 12 years taught at the Georgia Archives Institute. SGA will be forever grateful to Dr. Gracie for his crucial early work in support of the society and the archives profession. And with that, I would now like to introduce our keynote speaker, Dorothy Berry. Ms. Berry is the Digital Collections Program Manager at Harvard University's Houghton Library and holds an MLS and an MA in Ethnomusicology from Indiana University. Through her work with Umbra Search, African American History at the University of Minnesota, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, the Black Film Center Archive, and the Archives of African American Music and Culture, she has advanced her co commitment to expanding access to archival materials through innovative digital and physical methodologies that unite stakeholder communities with their often displaced heritages. Ms. Berry's work focuses particularly on the intersections of information science and African-American history, ranging from newspaper database research on the earliest mentions of African-American concert music performances to inventory design for the cosmetic kit of Hollywood's first black woman makeup artist to exhibit curation, highlighting transatlantic art inspired by African-American film. Ms. Berry's talk today is entitled, My Soul Looks Back in Wonder, Remembering Black History in the Archives. I want to thank Ms. Berry for being with us this morning and welcome her to kick off this year's annual meeting. It is a joy and honor to speak with you all this morning. In a year of remote panels and presentations, I must admit that this one was one I was quite nervous about accepting. Upon receiving the email invitation, I immediately sent a text message to my dear friend and colleague, Spellman archivist Holly Smith, asking for her opinion. My issue was less that I was concerned about overexposure, though I'm sure you all will be glad to hear this is my last public speaking event for a while, and more about being sure I can appropriately speak to Georgia archivists, as this state has born, trained, and housed so many archivists and special collections workers who have influenced my career both formally through mentoring advice and through the equally important informal kinship of professional collegiality. There are honestly too many to name, but in thinking of the works colleagues like Holly and Andreas Jackson Gavin 
do supporting archival work at HBCUs. The Educational Foundation colleagues like Derek Mosley and Stephen Booth received at Morehouse. Remembering the life and work of the late greats, Brenda Banks and Pelham McDaniels III. I was personally struck and humbled by the outsized influence Georgia archivists have had both in my career and specifically in their remembrance of black history in the archives. This is also a week when Georgia has been in the national spotlight in new and to some unexpected ways. The Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post, all sorts of papers of record that traditionally haven't paid too much mind to Georgia are churning out think pieces on changing demographics and voter registration. The state itself is inspiring national conversations on building partnerships and dismantling barriers as assumptions are upturned in a state that is now more than 10% foreign born with an increasingly diverse electorate. A Southern state with outsized influence, and I will freely admit, I felt a bit nervous talking to my colleagues tasked with collecting, preserving, and sharing the rich histories that led to this current moment and the contemporary materials that will shed light on our moment for future generations. Reflecting on the theme of this year's conference, I've been thinking about the ways we've been both professionally disconnected this year and at the same time exposed to more opportunities to hear from colleagues across the globe than ever before. Building relationships online is easier for some and terrifying for others, but in this moment, it is all most of us have. Fault lines in our historic practices that have focused often by necessity on in-house reading room service have been made apparent as suddenly all we can offer is what we have online. And what we have online is often narrowly, narrowly tailored by a stream of grants, faculty interests and low hanging fruit. Building relationships and dismantling barriers are a life's work, but a firm foundation for that work can be built on humbling practices of listening and remembering. This year has led to a wellspring of panels, presentations, and keynotes on Black history in LIS. I have delivered a few of them myself. In planning to speak with you all, I wondered what I could bring that would be new, fresh, exciting, I've recently been thinking about the ways in which humility should serve a stronger role in my own personal life, though, and that has spiraled into my professional world. In the spirit of humility, I can't say that I have anything new, fresh, or exciting to share, or that there are not other wise colleagues who are capable of bringing that innovative insight. I do want to focus on two known skills that we can all hone to better understand the work we do and the people it affects. Listening and remembering are two of the most important skills we can have as archivists, but they often seem to get short shrift. It's hard to boast about soft skills and listening and remembering are so soft they might not even feel like skills at all. We work to preserve, conserve, arrange, describe, skills learned from years of experience and earned with piles of student loans. As our field becomes more conscious about the ways in which we are collectively have erased, ignored, and devalued marginalized people's materials, it is key that we take that recognition and silence our own desires for permission and absolution. A collective recognition that institutions with power have ignored Black history provides an important space for those institutions to quiet themselves and to listen to folks who have been doing this work without recognition and remember the ways that institutions have perpetuated other struggles. I am using collective language to acknowledge the ways that I have been complicit. Perhaps you are not as guilty as I am, and this is not a particular accusation towards any individual or place. We can all benefit, however, from listening and remembering and looking for the ways we can let others know, uh, and looking for the ways we can let others who know better take the lead in areas in which we have failed. An advantage to remote work for me, a cubicle dweller, has been the ability to listen to music while I work. One of my favorite albums, what I always listen to straight through, is Nina Simone's 1968 Nuff Said. It's a live concert album recorded at the Westbury Music Festival on April 7th, 1968 three days after the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. 
Live albums are always a sort of archival revenant, primary source snapshots to a sound and a moment. This recording, perhaps more than others due to the tension of a world-changing assassination, and the first performance of the heartbreaking classic, Why the King of Love is Dead. The concert starts off more calmly though, and it's the second track, Sunday in Savannah, that made me think about the role listening can play in archival work. Sunday in Savannah was written by Hugh McKay and before Simone put her spit on it, it was recorded 10 years earlier by Rosemary Clooney. If you listen to Rosemary Clooney singing and then Nina Simone, it's clear that the songs are the same, the melody slightly shifted, the rhythm adjusted. You might shrug off the songs as pretty much the same, though you'd be fair to have a preference one way or the other. Lyric sites online would tell you that the words are exactly the same. A close listen though brings out some subtle differences that make the songs completely distinguishable. Rosemary sings, young folks tending Sunday school. They sing merrily about the golden rule, Parsons droning all the day, yea, verily, in the righteous way. Time to call on old Aunt Hannah while she sits there waiting for her last reward. One more Sunday in Savannah. Don't you dare go fishing, son. Amen. When Nina's tells it, she sings, young folk tend in Sunday school. They sing merrily about the golden rule. Parsons preaching all the day. They all holler in the righteous way. It's time for me to call on Mother Hannah while she sits there wishing for her last reward. One more Sunday in Savannah. Don't you dare go fishing, son, amen. The differences here relate to racialized faith practices, sardonic big band singing versus referential civil rights era religiosity. But noticing that requires you to stop and really listen beyond simply Rosemary Clooney and Nina Simone are very different performers. Beyond listening, it might even require you to do some footwork to understand what it is you're hearing that's different. This sort of labor requires humility and respect, a dedication of time we too often feel we don't have to give to archival subjects and to the inheritors of their stories. In my work theorizing and practicing descriptive equity, I've often been greeted by grateful colleagues from various institutions who say to me, it's so great that you've done this work. We had no idea what to do when we were describing this collection related to race or gender or ability or whatever else. I always want to respond in the secret petty part of myself. Oh, well, what did you try that didn't work out? Who did you ask? What did you read? We work in a world of control and authority. And it can feel as though when those arenas do not have answers and we cannot find anyone else that we recognize as an authority with an answer, that the only solution is to throw up our hands and do what we know isn't best. I'm not all at all making an argument towards perfectionism. In fact, my failings are ever before me. I am, however, pushing for more time and space for listening even if that means hearing things that contradict what we know to be right about history, about users, and about importance. Nina Simone had an unmatched ability to arrange an otherwise banal song into something touching and timeless. That arranging shifted the narrative of a piece and opened it up to new listeners. We often think we know the stories we have to tell in our archives. We begrudge previous collectors for focusing on old white men. We excuse our current practices by claiming to wait for new hires with the real expertise to come in and clean up our acts. This type of behavior is often shame-based and fear-based, but humility allows for the radical vulnerability to ask, what do you see in this collection that I don't? Or even, what can I see in this collection beyond what I've assumed? Some may hear this talk of arranging narrative and think that isn't the place of archivist and that isn't our job. I don't relish being the one to inform you in that case that it's always been the job. Every biog hiss note is a choice. Every subject heading is a judgment call. Judgment and professional norms guide the extent to which we interpret, but subjectivity is the only option for those of us who piece together history from whatever papers got left behind. 
Listening also means keeping ourselves open to the possibility that we may be wrong about what makes our collections and our work interesting. I was recently asked to lead a section of a gen ed course and the professors asked if I could recommend a reading to get the students familiar with finding aids. I made a bold move and assigned the first half of Greg Wiederman's The Historical Hazards of Finding Aids because I thought it would be interesting for students to not just think about how to navigate an archive space PUI, but to demystify how these creations came to be. When I mentioned to friends in the field what I've done, I was roundly razzed for assigning something both too hard and that students would not possibly be interested in. Only a dedicated archivist could care about something like the history of finding aids. The morning of the class, I was emailed a list of questions the students had submitted in advance. One of them, I will never forget, began with, I'm immediately curious what Dorothy Berry's stance is on finding aids. In an age of digitization and now remoteness, how can we use technology to aid our work in historical research, particularly of untold and silenced voices? If you would have told me that someone at any point in my life would say, I'm immediately curious about Dorothy Berry's stance on finding aids, I would have assumed you were a psychic who could foresee future sarcasm. It never occurred to me that I might have a stance on finding aids, or that would be something anyone would be interested in. The remote context brought in a new possibility for students to engage with the material outside of the physical barriers of archival space, but also outside our all too common framings that we know finding aids can be confusing or that we know it's hard to search our systems. What I heard when I listened to these students was that search description archives were deeply interesting, not just for their content, but the structures themselves and how they affect what can be found. I have heard over and over again this year that students have complex and detailed insights into specifically how description and discovery affects their relationship to history and particularly to black history. Their potential engagement has been assumed not to exist, but once they are invited in and allowed to say their piece, it's become clear to me that the undervaluing archivists often feel in the academy is sometimes not shared by the students themselves. Listening itself, of course, has a shorter shelf life. In another class recently, a student asked me the very heavy question of how I handle a moment in which there's a great deal of interest in Black history and culture with the knowledge that bubbles pop and that a lot of institutions will make short-term investments with short-term memories. People without institutional support by necessity often have to keep our long-term memory ourselves. This has led to rich streams of ancestral knowledge passed down both orally and materially, completely outside the power structures of state institutions and universities, but has also, of course, led to forced forgettings and erasures. Mahalia Jackson's performance of Clara Ward's How I Got Over at the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom how I got over is marked by the now famous line, my soul looks back and wonder how I got over. Clara Ward's sister, Willa, recounted that the song's 1951 composition was inspired by a harrowing encounter in Atlanta, Georgia. The Ward sisters were successful gospel performers and were passing through the city in their Cadillac when they were approached and attacked by a group of white men who were enraged by their blackness and their apparent financial success. Their sister Gertrude was finally able to scare the group off by pretending she was possessed, spewing language and behavior that no one would expect from a sanctified singing lady. Ingenuity in the face of terror is a hallmark of those who have the will to survive when the world would prefer they perish. We have to remember that whatever relationships we build we build exist with the knowledge that we previously ignored the possibility. Whatever barriers we dismantle were not accidentally assembled, but were set up with plan and purpose. Regardless of archival erasure, there is nothing an institution can do to make the past go away. There is a presentism in assuming that value and truth exist in only what we can prove with documentary evidence 
and the deep privilege in using institutional power to define what documentary evidence is. There is a hubris that weighs documents differently. The memories I have of my grandmother's childhood passed down from her in old age are less valuable evidence than if she would have written them down when she was in her 40s. For decades, scholars impugned the value of oral histories because memory is faulting, while valuing, valuing contemporaneous writings as though they were factual encounters. Historian Stephanie E. Roger, Jones Rogers skillfully calls out the overvaluing of textual evidence in her book, They Were Her Property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South, when discussing her scholarship's use of federal works projects, oral histories of formerly enslaved people, she writes that some historians caution against relying upon the testimonies of the formerly enslaved people gathered in the mid 20th century. They contend that formerly enslaved people could not possibly have understood what slavery entailed because most of them were children when, the, when slavery thrived in the South. They suggest that even if the survivors were old enough to have experienced their bondage in all its dimensions, it was unlikely they remembered the details clearly. Some 70 years had intervened between emancipation and the interviews. At the same time, Jones Rogers points out that many of the white married slave owning women she studies were unable to read and write in spite of their potential ac economic privilege. For decades, the possibilities of the past have therefore been willingly forgotten by scholarly demands for specific sourcing. This ideology has affected our work as archivists which is often for practic strictly practical reasons tied to what papers we have preserved. I am not necessarily making demands that we all become oral historians, become interpreters, identify as memory workers. I'm simply thinking that sometimes we underappreciate the trainings and callings those types of work can require in our attempt to see our field's future through more just eyes. What I am asking is that we all work to adapt humble practices of remembering all the things we don't know. When we act as though our choices are neutral or our descriptions are objective, we are making choices. We are deciding what will get remembered as truth. Sometimes that decision can feel made for us. Scant evidence tells scant, possibly inaccurate stories. Choosing to hold incompleteness as a core feature of the archive and to remember that for every perspective offered in our collections by an eyewitness, there were other sets of eyes. Eyes who didn't write, eyes who couldn't afford paper, eyes who lost their records in a move, eyes who stored their stories in the attic and never thought to donate them to an archive, but still had an equal say in the moment but still had as much insight as the person who had paper and pen. Remembering what we don't know and listening for the voices that are missing open up archives to long neglected histories that supplement our holdings with the actively excluded perspectives that can welcome in new audiences who have previously felt ignored by our work. Humility is not a competitive skill in a tight job market. In a world where institutions are rushing towards inclusion, working to solve a long-term problem in a short period of time, activities like listening and remembering may not feel compelling. I know I struggle with the urge to self-promote, to claim knowledge, to establish myself as one to be listened to and remembered. Working with history though, means we have a responsibility to those who came before us. We are in agreement, we are in an agreement with those whose records we steward to remember their humanity and to listen not only to what we want to hear from their records, but to what they wanted to say. Remembering black history in the archives can be more ephemeral than ephemera. Like listening to a live recording, we often only get a shadow of the lived experience. The subtlety and difficulty makes the work even more urgent, makes rethinking our processes from description to instruction more key and makes admitting what we don't know, not an act of shame, but one of optimism. Thank you so much for your time and I look forward to being in conversation with you all. 
Thank you so much for that thought provoking and galvanizing talk and for helping us to think differently about what it means to listen, remember, and exercise humility as archivists. It's just a lot to take away and consider. We have a good amount of time for questions and discussion. I anticipate that many of you listening have things you would like to ask um, Dorothy to elaborate on or questions to address. So feel free at any point to submit your questions in the chat box or through the Q&A tool, which you will see down at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I will watch for your questions to come in and read those out. While some of you are thinking about your questions and writing them up, um, I have a couple that I could start with. Um, so, so I wondered if you might be able to, I was interested in what you said about the overvaluing of textual evidence and of specific types of documentary evidence. And I wonder if you could say a little bit more about how that affects your practice as an archivist, um, how you weigh textual evidence against other types when you make decisions about um, collecting or access or description. How do you approach that? Sure. It's, um, when I think about overvaluing of textual evidence, I don't think of that in terms of, you know, overvaluing the conservation or the preservation or even really the collecting to a certain extent. When I think of the overvaluing, it really comes in when we think about access and interpretation. We often present a collection, perhaps I'll make up a fake collection, you know, of individual person's papers. And we talk about all the ways that those are examples of what it was like to be alive in that particular historical moment, which is true because those are that person's paper. But thinking more broadly, what they really are is the truth of that individual in that moment. So sometimes, you know, we might have a single piece of paper for an event and the person said, oh, this was the best concert in the world and the singer was amazing. And we present this as, you know, for example, uh, you know, I can't think of her name right now but someone perhaps who passed away before any of us had recorded material. We don't know what they sound like. All we have is this written evidence. But at the other hand, someone else went to that concert and thought she stunk. And that's just a fact because people exist and have different opinions. And I think for me that comes into that interpretation of really individualizing the stories we tell and relating that to our broader history. So it's a way of thinking about history of not, you know, this piece of paper proved what people felt but it more that these pieces of paper give a glimpse into what people felt. And sometimes, you know, it can be even humorous the way we wait for that one piece of paper, paper to show, oh, you know, maybe people didn't all feel the way that textbooks of the time say they felt. I think of, um, I think at the British Library, they recently, I don't know, they didn't discover, but they recently were publishing about um, a yeoman farmer's, uh, personal diary from the early modern period. And in his personal diary, he wrote about a, uh, a hanging case that had happened for sodomy. And his personal diary said something along the lines that he just didn't think that was a hanging offense. And if somebody did that sort of thing, they probably just were made that way. And you know, that why would you judge somebody for how they're made is what he wrote. And people were very shocked and it's like, oh, this is an example of a different view on sexuality than we maybe thought existed at the time. But also it's sort of, we were waiting for the piece of paper to tell us not everyone felt a certain way just because that's what homilies said or what the laws said. And it's the same sort of thing of, you know, we want a piece of paper that proves a certain thing and maybe it exists and maybe it doesn't. I think that that's really, for me, that moves into how we interact with these materials with scholars and students more so than even description. You know, scholars are really engaging with sort of critical fabulation to use Hartman's term to fill in the gaps that the more Foucaultian like memory type, the archive <laughs> doesn't have. But I think that that uh, maybe doesn't play into how we describe the material but it does play into how we talk about it with students and also how we engage people who previously have felt that they are not in these records. Because if we have the records of perhaps a rich merchant, by the nature of having their records, we have the record 
you know, we have the critical record and the imaginary of the people they sold to and the people that worked for them and the people that passed by their shop on the street. Okay, thank you. So I have a question that's come in through the question and answer tool from Tamara Livingston. The question is, as an ethnomusicologist, do you see performative aspects about archives? Perhaps the role of archivists as creators as well as keepers? Sure, yeah, I mean, archivists are definitely creators, especially our processing buds. And you know, uh, it's definitely a work of creation. And I think it's a work of scholarly creation that's often um, because of the way systems are set up in both the government and in um, your record keeping and in academia can seem like it is service work that goes towards future scholarship. But thinking of all the knowledges that are gained by, you know, everyone who works in the archives and special collections, even just when they give you a collection and you don't know anything about that individual. And by the end of processing it, you are some type of scholar on that. And sometimes depending on the thing, you might be the leading scholar on that topic. But that work is just not going through the traditional um, channels of academic scholarship sometimes. And so it gets you know left behind. But I definitely think of us as creators. I think there are I mean, there are clearly performative aspects all around in everything everyone does. But I think the creator role is important because it's also a sense of value and self that I think the profession holds and sometimes maybe can hold even more proudly. Thank you. I'm switching over to a question from the chat box from Daria Lubinsky. Regarding description, do you think original folder titles should be altered if they contain offensive language? Is a folder title just a pointer or does it have archival value? Good question. I think it depends on a couple of things from my vantage point. I guess I will frame this at the beginning by saying I think that these are sort of a place where I don't know rights and wrongs necessarily. So this is really just what I have been working with in this moment. And maybe someone can teach me something better and I'll change my methodology. But my way of thinking about it has to do with a couple of different facets. One is if the offensive language is, act is necessary for discovery of that item. So perhaps um, thinking of something like the YMCA's colored works department which was extant for decades and did amazing work in African-American communities. Some people might not want colored in their catalog. I, that's not my feeling, but some people might say, this is an offensive term, I want to remove it. But anyone who was studying the YMCA or looking for it, might they would search for the known term, right? Um, that name authority. I think sometimes we can mitigate offensive title work in our description so maybe if the title says Colored Works Department, you might say this is a folder from the Colored Works Department and African-American organization, bop, 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 and then you don't reuse that language. I think that if the offensive title is the work of previous staff, you know, if it's a archivist created title that is currently uh, inappropriate or offensive, depending on the level, I have sometimes, um, changed the title and then added in the processing notes that the title was originally a different title. Um, I guess, depending on the severity of the offense, you might want to put that in a non-published uh, note. I do think that as the question asks, there is archival value and erasing, you know, it's a balance of not wanting to punish current users for our sake of keeping archival record, but also not wanting to, um, erase the history of archival description. And as I just said, if we are creators who are doing our own types of scholarly work, saving that and showing that progression is also important. Thank you. I have another question over in the Q&A, and that is from Anika Austin. She says, to balance the emphasis on textual evidence, do you have any thoughts about embodiment and how archivists can work with embodied memory to fill in some of the gaps of the written record? It's a great question and one that I'm only slightly qualified to answer compared to other folks who have done so much more work with embodiment and sort of thinking of new ways of bringing in ways of knowing to archives. I think that there are some obvious 
ways of doing it. And that can be through, you know, expanding the AV um, holdings. And maybe instead of saying, wanting to collect the papers from someone who's a storyteller, maybe wanting to do recordings of that individual and finding ways to bring that in, bring the embodiment in and not asking the people to translate their work into the paper form that we might prefer traditionally. I think also for me, when I see this question, my thought is I, what I would want to do, what I would need to do is really engage more with people who do embodied memory work. Um, and I want to hear, I guess for me, I want to hear what they think the right thing to do is and how I could bring that in to my practice. Because again, I say recording is best. And maybe they would say, video cannot capture this. This is how we think we should be captured. And I think that it's difficult because a lot of the things that would be more innovative or capture other ways of knowing require amounts of time that have been deeply snipped out of our processing budgets um, and our workflows, even if we are just dealing with paper. We have less time to look up in reference texts how to describe a known figure beyond wanting to do the sort of engaged and embedded work you would need to do to get community investment. And I think that that is what I would hope to see as a investment that our institutions can make is transition, pardon me, transitioning to deeper investment in that type of embedded work and note learning from other types of historical keepers as opposed to some of the more flashy or, um, you know, temporal DEI work that is more trendy within academic spaces. Thank you. And I think if we could maybe just pick up on what you said about hearing from other people who do embodied memory work. Um, and I will turn that out to our audience as an invitation. If you do that kind of work or you have thoughts about it, um, please comment in the chat, um, share your thoughts about that. Yeah, I'd like to welcome anyone who has any thoughts to share them as well, not just questions, because, you know, this is a, the virtual world is complicated and I think conversation should be encouraged. Absolutely, thank you. So all of you listening, um, feel free to, to share comments as well as questions. Anything that you would like to share with us or have us discuss or just consider. So we have another question in the chat from Angela Stanley. Angela says, do you have any suggestions for how we might document, either in finding aids or in other ways, archivists' own implicit biases, limits in knowledge, subjectivity, etc.? I'm thinking back to Michelle Light's 2007 article on this topic. Are there any practices that you employ or have seen others use? What I really have appreciated and have been bringing up all the time, and because I just think they did a great job, is um, Temple University's statement, Special Collections Research Center's statement on archival description. It's a very long text on their website that both responds to patrons who might be discovering um, description that is offensive to them or that they think needs addressing, but also provides a background on what archival description is um, and how it is subjective and influenced by time and space and money, et cetera. I think something like that is something I would like to see all of us have because there's the individual level, you know, I think as you know, mentioned, I have a background in ethnomusicology and Indiana's program is a joint department of folklore and ethnomusicology. And a very common practice in ethnography is to sort of have a lengthy introduction that tells a lot about who you are as a subject so that the reader can know, you know, who is telling me, who is making the observation. So it would be not uncommon in that field maybe to say, I'm Dorothy Berry and I grew up in Southwest Missouri. My mother is a Jewish woman from Brooklyn. My father is African-American. They converted to Eastern Orthodoxy in the 1980s and have this whole thing. So you could say, these are the eyes through which she was seeing this uh, you know, community that she is writing an ethnography on. I think there is an extent to which that is a very heavy burden to lay on any individual archivist. Um, I think nobody might, also people might not read it if they, we all had to have that. Um, 
and especially given the general demographics of our field, I think a lot of them would probably just say like, I am a white woman and I went to college with a BA in history or literature. Um, but I think that that sort of more overarching statement that is linked heavily and shares, you know, shares the subjectivity of the field and just gives a perspective on that field. I think that because we have sort of let ourselves seem like background actors and then this history stuff, these signing aids are just there. How do they get there? No one knows. It's made it seem like they're an objective field that then history historians use to create their subjective historical interpretations. And I think letting people in more to the vagaries of our profession, which is its own, you know, professional norms and scholarly norms and practices would help people know. A colleague of mine um, has been doing really fantastic, she's gonna publish soon, we'll all be really happy, user research studies on how users interact with finding aids. And one of the sort of things she brought up more casually, you know, colloquially outside of her actual research results was how much even really advanced scholars sort of assume we all, everything is made up. Like they don't know that we have controlled vocabularies. They're just assuming that that's what somebody picked right then. Which is a, probably a pain to everyone who's searched for an appropriate heading to just think someone thinks we're just like, oh, here you go. <laughs> and I think that letting them in, sort of as I mentioned in the talk, letting people in more to the ways that our work happens will be more interesting and edifying to them than Maybe it feels to us, you know, when we're just doing the work. Makes a lot of sense. I'm about to drop into the chat a link to a Temple University Library webpage, which might be what you were. That is exactly to. what I was talking about. Perfect. Thank you. Right. Another question from Maggie Libby. Oh, well, just a comment actually, but I will share this out for everyone. Maggie Libby says that. Ms. Chow of Princeton is a fabulous expert in oral history and ideas of embodied knowledge. She gave a seminar at the Columbia Oral History Summer Program that was deeply moving about deep listening, leaving expectations and needs aside and asking, what do I need to know to understand the person standing before me? So that's a great thought and a suggestion of an expert to look to who can help us think about embodied um, memory and that kind of work and how it fits in with our work as archivists. And I think that quote is such a fantastic one. Thank you so much, uh, Maggie, for sharing that. Um, because it makes me think about sort of my natural predilection, I think is an empathetic one towards archival subjects in a way that is, I don't wanna say that it's better, that it's maybe a little goofy, but I've often kind of felt that sort of, well, why are we talking about this person? We don't even know them. We just have this piece of paper. And I thought about an, an anecdote, or I guess an example of that, I think of as sort of the ways in which both we as archivists and also historians more so than us, often will find a historical primary source document and sort of laugh at the misunderstanding the person in the past had. I remember once I was, um, someone was talking about some letters that someone had written to a young person's organization at the turn of the century. And this young man had written in because he was seriously concerned with his uh, onanistic tendencies. And we were all laughing because he was really concerned that he would get, people were laughing because they were concerned that he, he was concerned he would be sick or that he was a dissolute person or that maybe he would die because he had such a bad habit. And we were laughing because we know that you don't die from that. But in the moment I actually got kind of mad at this room because this was a real person who had a legitimate concern based on the things that he knew at that moment. And yeah, that's not medically accurate. <laughs> But it was not irrational for him to think that way and to be worried. And I think that that's that thing. What do we need to know about them? And what do we need to respect about these archival subjects when we talk about them in our present moment where we have different understandings? And I don't mean that to excuse, you know, sometimes people say that, well, how would someone in the past have known that slavery was wrong? And that can be used as a way to wheedle out. But what we do have luckily is enough voices that say, well, they would know it was wrong because all these other people gave all these examples for how it was wrong. And even if they didn't listen to those other white abolitionists, you can't say nobody knew slavery was wrong because all these enslaved people knew it was wrong. So it's that sort of thinking of what do we need to know about individuals and their larger context, I think is really, really key to how we share the things that we hold. That's a, a helpful 
framing too to think about zooming out, incorporating that broader context to find the right balance between accountability and empathy that we bring to the creators of these records. I have a question from Wendy Hagenmeyer who says, how do you think professional organizations can nurture listening, remembering, and humility in archivists? What roles can professional organizations play in nurturing these skills? And where can organizations sometimes fall short? That's a good question. I think the ways we can encourage them, I guess I don't know how they can be done necessarily at an organizational level, but I think on the individual level, when we're thinking of how we participate within these organizations, um, I think a lot of the sort of um, active bystander type thinking, because so many times I think, especially a lot of people with archivist personalities, you might be in a room and hear a Q&A and something or something and someone's clearly being way too hard on this person or someone's asking a loaded question or we know this is a senior person and they are really kind of attacking this student who has their first panel. And a lot of times we just let that stand. I think that the sort of actions that we would all want anyone to have for us, even if it's not the, you know, bold move of standing up and saying, this breaks the code of conduct, you need to sit down. If it's going up to that person later and saying, that was kind of weird. I have had moments where I've seen a young person and it could be, and this is not really age-based, these are just a particular example. A young person ask a pretty loaded question about race and it was, you know, it wasn't loaded, but it, the implication was very much that the people in the panel did not know as much as the young person and were not on top of things. And they responded, in kind. And I felt bad because I I was a very inappropriate young person, but to sort of like, I understood where they were coming from. And I came up to them afterwards and just said, hey, uh, I kind of feel like maybe you didn't get the answer that you were looking for from that panel. I felt like it was a good question, but maybe uh, you might want to know that actually such and such panelist has been doing this work for like 20 years and has actually really deep relationships with the community. So they, you might want to look into their work. It's pretty neat. I think that sort of like, even though we may not think of ourselves that way in archives, especially putting aside um, some of that professional competitiveness that makes you want to just sort of see someone fall because you can rise up or makes you want to stay away from someone who seems inappropriate so it doesn't get inappropriate sprinkles on you. <laughs> I think that sort of friendliness or I, I guess I don't even think of it as friendliness because I'm not implying that people need to do things that are deeply personal, but collegiality. Um, but then also this week has been DLF week, Digital Library Federation, which I'm really actively involved in. And I feel like as an organization, they do have a very good culture of sort of friendliness and listening and remembering. And it seems to me that that must come from just a huge amount of extra work from their staff because they are always very friendly and open to questions and things like that. So I think that for me, thinking of it as more collegiality than as things you can force, you can put on from the top down, it has to come bottom up, I guess is how I'll summarize that. Thank you. Our next question is from Tamara Livingston, who, oh, a comment. Um, Tamara notes that it seems that historians view archivists as passive agents, and it would seem helpful to claim our space as part of the historical endeavor. I agree. I've been thinking about that a lot lately. It's humorous because you know I work at Harvard, so our history professors at least must think that they are the very best of the history professors. And so I, you know, staff can feel very, very much subservient to Harvard faculty. But what I have found <laughs> when I'm working with people is actually, you know, not everybody, but most of them have been really wanting more of this collegiality and they're inter they're, oh, arch I wish I would have had this knowledge from archivists. One of our professors who is very well known and does very you know, fancy work and has an agent and what <laughs> all that stuff was saying to me, oh, I wish I would have known all these things about archives when I was an undergrad. And I thought, I'm sure that I, I don't know where she went, probably Yale or somewhere fancy. It's like, I'm sure they wanted to do this. They wanted you to know this. And, you know, another professor in our history department said to me, he, wonder, he always wondered why, archiv why the archivists and librarians aren't involved with the digital humanities projects that the historians are doing. And I thought, 
it surely isn't because you asked them and they all said no. <laughs> so I'm in, I've been interested lately in sort of trying to claim a boldness, um, which I maybe don't feel because as you, I don't have a background in history and especially, you know, now that I work in a, a very lauded institution that I didn't personally attend, they're intimidating, but sort of taking that boldness and seeing, uh, I have been pleased to see that when I present myself as someone who thinks I am their scholarly equal or something, but just in a different way or different field, they have responded in kind. Or maybe even if it's not equal, maybe just a little bit lower. So we have a question from Sarah Quigley, who says that um, at her institution, they're trying to figure out right now how to reveal their own backgrounds, biases, and positionalities as archivists to users. And she hadn't thought of ethnography as a possible example of how to do that. She asks, does anyone have an example of one that's really good? I'm not an ethnographer and not at all familiar with the field. I'll leave that open to others. I will say I just had the, a re, like, you know, a graduate thesis flashback. <laughs> like, oh, what, what, what were all on my assigned readings? They've all spaced out. I'm free now. I don't remember. Fair enough. So if anyone has suggestions, feel free to share those in the chat. Have a comment from Rebecca Brown, who mentions coming from an anthropology undergrad background and feeling like acknowledging bias was drilled into them. So um, Rebecca came into the archives cheerleading anthropology and ethnography. So Rebecca, maybe you would be a great person to suggest some examples of ethnographically based practices for archivists to acknowledge bias. Rebecca's trying to recall. Awesome. If you think of something, please share it with us in the chat now. Or if you think of something later on during the conference, um, hop over to our uh, discussion channel on Slack and share that. I would love to hear what you have to say, and I think others would too. We have a question from Leah Lefkowitz. Oh. Again, a comment. I should read questions before I read the messages before I start saying that. I used to work at the Houghton in the reading room and wanted to say hi. Wonderful place. I'll let folks know. All right, a question from Carrie Hintz in the Q&A. The concepts of humility and steward stewardship in the archives seem to be emerging in the archives discourse recently. Do you think that there is a broader move in the profession away from thinking of ourselves as authorities or the sort of jockeying for eminence or status and towards a different model? I think that from my vantage, I think that it's probably more, I know that I don't think you presented, you maybe intended this way, Carrie, but I think it's probably more the former than the latter. So I think that's reflecting the ways in which academic scholarship in the humanities has moved away from authoritative presentation. I think that sort of trickled down in many ways to our thinking, because now it seems incongruous for us to say, this is the historical fact, these are authorities, this is how this works, when the professors and the scholars and the researchers are not presenting themselves that way. They're saying, you know, here's an interpretive gaze, here's a certain type of reading of this text, so then we seem outmoded. I think that, so potentially it's a different type of jockeying for eminence and status, because focusing on authority is no longer uh, the same type of status. But I hope that that moves towards a different model that is still beneficial and not based on, you know, changing tides just to fit in. Um, I do think also, you know, thinking of authorities and the way that that has worked in our field, not only as wanting to be authorities, but authorities in terms of having names a certain way and subjects a certain way. I think that as our users have become more and more used to in their personal lives doing searches that don't require accuracy at all. You know, these days, if you search for Dorothy in Google, you will also get Dorothea and you will get Doris. And that's the sort, that's what people are used to. Our focuses are now seeming even a different type of outmoded, you know? And I think that that is really challenging on an individual level because those are skills that we have learned and practiced and they have value. But I think that it's, it's part of a larger world in scholarship that is less focused on absolute, absolutism. Yeah. 
Thank you. And that's, it's interesting to consider the a shift away from absolutism and how that can in some ways cascade down through all of the choices that we make. And maybe that's a useful way to rethink some of these shifts that are happening as part of that broader trend. All right, I don't have any more active questions. So I will ask you another question while we give people a few more minutes to think. Um, we will end by 11.15, so we have a few more minutes. If you have questions you still want to send in. So while everyone's pondering, um, I will ask you, Dorothy, if you could maybe share some of the examples of alternative sources of authority that you turn to. You mentioned you know, the need to avoid throwing up our hands and just doing what we know isn't best because we don't recognize the sources of authority or we aren't familiar with other places we can turn. What are some of the either specific examples or broad types of less absolute or less recognized authorities that you like to turn to? Well, one that I think, what I think about the most, which is actually sort of funny because it's equally authoritative, is how often um, I feel like I've seen people not delve into just published, you know, peer-reviewed scholarship to learn about things that are outside of their subject area. So I've done a lot of work with racially inflammatory material um, a lot of blackface minstrelsy stuff and people are often like oh this is really racist and creepy and I don't want to deal with it and I couldn't really figure out how to describe it and for me the, the question was always like well did you read any of the literature <laughs> there's a ton of literature on that and you know it's not ref it might not be in the reference books that we use and it's definitely not accurate in any of our authorities but that's a different type of research you know that asks you to delve into history in a different way. Um, so that's kind of funny because that's almost just like this equally authoritative a published book from a university press. But I think that there's a lot of that that we don't pay attention to. And I think also for me, it's taking advantage of the access to a million different resources um, and being a little less tied to, I remember when I was in undergrad, I was doing a report on Melungeons in Appalachia and the professor told me that I couldn't use a website that wasn't from um, and didn't have like a .edu that wasn't a professional academic website. And that really cut off all of these great sources from people in that small community who had collected old newspapers, et cetera, to document their people that were not tied to universities. And that, I mean, that, that's, that dates me a little bit because I don't think professors would say that now, but I think we do sort of think that way sometimes of who, you know, I think we sometimes will ignore even the own community we're trying to describe, going back to sort of an anthropology or folkloric look at it. You know, we look at individuals within the community as being less uh, strong authorities on their experience because they're experiencing it. And I think letting people speak for themselves and then seeing that, yes, you know, this text might have more personal language than we want from an authority or this text might be more interpretive or less, less absolute in its phrasing, but being able to interpret that and trust ourselves as you know, smart people with professional understanding to translate that into a description. And that's, maybe there's a fear of sort of that, that moment of translation that you'll get it wrong, but um, you might get it right and you might get it wrong if you don't. So why not try and at least bring in those people and those voices. Absolutely. It, I, I appreciate your emphasis on the role of archivists in a way as, as translators, um, both from maybe historical scholarship and also from communities or creators and finding a way to bring the expertise or the authority from a range of sources together into what we do rather than staying isolated from, from either of those communities. Um, we have a comment from Angela Stanley, who just mentions, brings up the systematic devaluing of authority as it plays into alternative facts. She's interested to see how that plays out in academia and the rise of acknowledging personal subjectivity, I think is a, an interesting paradox here that we, and see both 
the necessity of thinking differently about authority, but also some of the problems with that. Yes, I will say I'm not like an extreme postmodernist. I do think facts exist. <laughs> <laughs> I think facts exist. I think very, various things can be uh, verified. Um, so yeah, it is a, it's a really interesting complication because I wouldn't want anyone to sort of, that is what I say, I think of it as translating more than interpreting because it is that difficult thing of, okay, if I'm agreeing that everything is subjective, well, how do I describe this in a way that isn't potentially presenting some sort of strange alternative history that I've just created? And it is, it's a different type of work and it's a different type of thinking. And it's hard and probably, I, I know I make mistakes because I, that's just what my whole deal is making mistakes. But I know like we all make mistakes in it, but I think it's still a worthy endeavor to try and shift. Well, I think that is a great note to end on. So we will wrap up here with just a couple of minutes um, to spare. So thank you so much, Dorothy Berry, for your wonderful presentation and for conversation and thoughts you've shared subsequently. It has been an honor to have you here. So well, thank you so much. I appreciate that. All of you.